pleasure to be here and talk about uh, uh, technology, which I love to talk about. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Lee Ratliff. I'm a principal analyst at IHS Market. IHS Market is a market intelligence or a research company. Uh, we cover um, many, many different areas from financial markets to energy markets, automotive, um, maritime, and so on. But the, tech, the division I'm in is the technology division. And we cover the, the, the gamut of technology from one end of the spectrum to the other. Uh, my specialty is in IoT connectivity, so good fit for, for LPWAN technologies and LoRaWAN. Uh, and it's very good timing. Um, for the past six months, we've been working on, a, on our fourth annual market update for LPWAN technologies. So we've been doing this, uh, uh, this is our fourth report, but we've been researching this area for, for about five years. Uh, just for this report, uh, it's been about six, six months or so, so a good, good chunk of time. Uh, I, I write this report with, my, with a colleague. Uh, I, I kind of come at this from a low power wireless uh, perspective, which is my background, and my, coll my colleague brings uh, the cellular IoT perspective, so he's more familiar with cellular, te cellular technologies and uh, traditional service providers. Uh, this, is, this is a report, you may want to check it out. I'll, I'll be covering a small fraction of the report. I'll just be talking about the top level findings today. It's a quite in-depth report uh, that, that covers all aspects of the LPWAN market and all technologies. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is a, a slide I've created just to kind of give you an idea of how we think about the, the, the IoT connectivity market. Uh, this is particularly geared towards long range IoT connectivity. Uh, so as you see here, it's, uh, it's uh, cellular IoT and LPWAN uh, technologies <laughs> primarily. <clears throat> but this shows that we kind of think of the the IoT in general as kind of a pyramid, where um, we, st we started uncovering this pyramid maybe 10 or 20 years ago with the, with the very first IoT applications. Back then, people called it M to M, and it was typically very, very expensive 2G and 3G cellular solutions that were addressing applications where the value of the data was so high that, that they would essentially do anything to connect that device to enable that, that uh, uh, data to get back and be, be, be used. And so uh, that's kind of where we were 10 or 20 years ago. Today that's morphed into a much larger market. We're talking about all kinds of applications and this has been enabled by uh, low cost connectivity. So we, we view this as, originally I kind of thought, thought of the IoT as, a, as an onion where as, as as cost of the connectivity gets lower and lower and lower, you're peeling away layers of the onion to, to introduce new markets, um, applications that have never been served by connectivity before. I finally decided an onion wasn't the right way to look at it because as you unpeel an onion, it gets smaller and smaller. A pyramid is a better way to look at it because as you unpeel this, uh, unpeel or let's say uh, 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 reveal the pyramid, it's, the market is actually getting larger and larger. So um, there, historically this market has been covered by cellular IoT, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now starting to look at 5G uh, implementations of cellular IoT. Um, but this is only the very tip of the pyramid. Uh, these, are, these tend to be exp expensive technologies that are complex. Yes, very high performance, but the IoT in general, the bulk of the IoT is not about high performance. Uh, so they do address a number of applications that do require high performance. And so like if you look at 5G, uh, a lot of people talk about 5G in the IoT. However, uh, 5G, uh, they're really only talking about a handful of applications. If you try to press somebody in, into in, in terms of what the 5G new radio will be used for in the IoT, they typically talk about three applications. They talk about uh, process control or, or some kind of industrial automation, which is mission critical and very expensive, needs very, very low latency. They talk about V to X. They talk about uh, V to X in terms of, of um, autonomous cars. 
And yes, that's, a, that's another application that requires that kind of performance. And then finally, medical. Specifically, a lot of people talk about remote medical procedures and, and uh, surgical robots is a famous example that's used here. And those are, those are the three technologies and uh, the three applications that most people talk about when they talk about 5G and the IoT. But that is literally just the tip of the pyramid here. Uh, we're, IoT, of course, is used, uh, cellular IoT is used for far more than those, than those applications. It's also into you know, wearables, digital signage, kiosks, ATMs, and those kind of things. These are still relatively high performance applications, and typically they're, they're mains powered, so they're not battery operated. Now, as connectivity gets cheaper, we're, in, we're, we're revealing more levels of this pyramid, and as, as that happens, the, the value of the data gets lower and lower. The initial applications could be, uh, the implementation could be very expensive because the data was very, very valuable. Um, but if we stopped there, we would, we would still leave most things unconnected. So we need to get the cost of connectivity lower and lower so that we can address applications where the data is not very valuable. We look at the bottom of this pyramid and you see soil moisture monitoring and package tracking and disposable sensors. And maybe 20 years ago, people did not even think about connecting these kind of applications. You didn't think about putting a moisture meter in, in a field or, or having a, a full uh, uh, networking capability on, on packages that you're tracking. But today, we can see that that is within reach, um, that we're getting the cost of connectivity low enough that we can enable those kind of solutions. And, as we, and when we do, it's going to be LPWAN that addresses these. Um, there's a number of LPWAN technologies which I'll be covering next, uh, and there's layers to those technologies as well. Some of them are more high performance, some of them are lower performance. They have different cost points, but, the, but this whole strata in the lower part of the pyramid is covered by uh, LPWAN technologies that exist today. Uh, some of the applications that, uh, that we cover in the report, we cover these at, at the high levels shown at the, on the left smart meters and utilities, connected spaces, consumer, and so on. And then on the right, you can see some examples. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list. It's not comprehensive. These are just some of the top examples uh, that, that we researched in the course of the report. And these are some of the more, uh, some of the larger examples or more interesting emerging examples. Um, I won't go over all of these. You can, you can read this at your leisure. Uh, I think these uh, slides will be available after the presentation. A couple of things I wanted to point out, like connected spaces. A lot of people might say, "What, what is connected spaces?" Um, here we have we we originally called this smart cities, but we but we really decided, you know, it's it's much more than that. We went we we put in smart buildings in this category, and there's another area which, which few people talk about, and that's public spaces. And um, this is a really hot area for IoT connectivity today. And this is airports, stadiums, museums, just any kind of public space. Um, maybe, uh, maybe not so much like government buildings because that would be more in a smart buildings aspect. But 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 categories that don't fit in in smart cities or uh, smart buildings. Uh, consumer consumer has not been a traditional uh, target area for LP WAN technologies. Uh, they're more really industrial. Uh, applications are the, the early adopters of LPWAN technology, but we are seeing significant interest starting to arise in consumer applications, some of which already are on the market today. I can talk more about those later. Uh, asset management, this is much more than asset tracking. To us, this is, this is a much larger uh, view of, of, of than, than simply asset tracking. We're looking at managing of assets, and this is a very broad category. You'll see that a lot of volume goes into this category. Uh, transportation and then other other applications. Uh, there's always, especially with the IoT, there's such a long tail in the IoT, there's literally tens of thousands or possibly even hundreds of thousands of applications eventually that will be using these technologies. So we we can't do without another category. Other category. We do expect that some of these applications will be breaking out into the future as we get more visibility and uh, they become more prominent. Uh, agriculture uh, would certainly be one of those, possibly medical health as well. Okay, so I, I titled this Stereotyping of LPWAN Technologies because over the past years as I've, as I've uh, studied these technologies, I've realized that 
what may look kind of monolithic from the outside when you're just approaching this industry, you, you may look at this and say, well, you've got these four uh, LP WAN technologies and then a dozen others that we don't have listed here, and they're all relatively <coughs> equivalent. Well, that's not really true. Some of the, there's a lot of overlapping, of course, but when you, when you get down to it, a lot of these technologies, the, the technologies are very differentiated. And even when, from a technical perspective, they're not so differentiated, quite often they are differentiated in terms of business model um, or just the way the ecosystem is arranged. Um, anyways, if we're gonna stereotype these technologies, let's do it in one sentence. And so for LoRa and LoRaWAN, I call this the accessible choice for private networks and for, for non-traditional wireless service providers. So uh, I think this is really the sweet spot for, for, for LoRa and LoRaWAN today. Um, when you start looking at public networks, uh, they're really, you can really divide that into two categories. They're run by traditional wireless service providers or they're, they're, or they're driven by non-traditional uh, wireless service providers. And I think the, that when you're looking at the differentiation here, uh, uh, LoRaWAN certainly has the non-traditional wireless service providers covered. Uh, NBIOT is going to be a choice, and just to skip down to that, that's, I call that the comfortable choice for traditional wireless service providers. It's uh, proposed by, uh, it's, a, it's a standard that was proposed by traditional um, networking vendors, Huawei and Ericsson and others. Uh, it's uh, a 3GPP standard, it's an area of comfort, it's licensed spectrum, all of these fit right into the comfort zone of traditional wireless service providers. So our view is that more often than not, traditional wireless service providers are gonna go that direction, whereas non-traditional wireless service providers are, are, are more likely to use LoRa or LoRaWAN. Uh, LoRa and LoRaWAN do not require licensed spectrum. You can, you, you can use them for private networks or public networks. There's a lot of, again, ways to differentiate even similar technologies like NBIoT and LoRa. Uh, Sigfox, um, I don't mean this in a negative way, but Sigfox, I think I like to think of as a minimum viable network for low-end applications, and I, uh, I think that the folks at Sigfox would actually agree with me here. Uh, when I've talked to them before, one of their executives uh, described uh, Sigfox as he said, "You see the information superhighway." Well, Sigfox is the dirt road that goes along next to it. So I think Sigfox understands their position in, 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 the, in the stratus here. Um, and I don't think it's unfair to call them a minimum viable network. You know, from a technological perspective, they're missing uh, several key features that would, that would uh, enable Sigfox to be used in some higher end applications. But when it comes to the low end applications, uh, Sigfox has a better chance in terms of low cost, um, applications that really don't require a lot of features. Uh, LTM, on the other hand, is a, is a high performance standard, at least by LPWAN, uh, relative to other LPWAN technologies. Um, and we, we do have, we, we are optimistic on, on LTEM, which I'll go over next, but um, we do believe it is too expensive for the truly massive IoT. All of those applications we saw at the bottom of the pyramid in the, in the previous slide, uh, are typically going to be too cost sensitive for LTEM. Okay, this this slide looks like it has been messed up a little bit, <laughs> but um, uh, hopefully you can hopefully you can get you can see. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is this is messed up a little bit, but um, the conclusion of this. Is, this is our forecast uh, for LP WAN technologies through 2023 uh, by technology. So you can see here that we're, we're just going ahead and saying that it's really come down to a two horse race in, in LP WAN these days. Um, we've tracked, in, over the past five years, we've tracked a number of technologies. Five years ago, it was, it was really hard to narrow down to just a handful of technologies. There was at least a dozen different contenders just on the unlicensed spectrum side. Um, in terms of technologies wanting to be major players in this space. Uh, for the past few years, we've been tracking uh, these four technologies, uh, LoRa, Sigfox, NBIoT, LTEM, and then an others uh, category. Um, but this year, for the first time, it's really becoming clear that this is a two horse race. Uh, LoRa and NBIoT, we, we definitely expect these two technologies to account for the vast majority of LP WAN nodes over the next five years. 
Uh, you can see here that by 2023, we expect these two technologies will account for 86% of all LPWAN nodes. And uh, I, don't think, I don't think this is um, an aggressive forecast in terms of, of being, uh, I think we're, I think five years is, we, we, we have pretty good clarity into the f five years and we're, we're pretty confident in this forecast. Um, so, and it's not even really close. You can see here on the graph at the bottom right, it's, it's not like we're making a judgment call here that there was, that there was a lot of contenders that, that, were, were, in the, that were in this two horse race, but there really, there really aren't. You can see that today, Laura is uh, by far the leader in LPWAN, but we're expecting very high growth from NBIOT over the next couple of years, and we do expect it to catch up by the, by, towards the end of the forecast. Um, in terms of in terms of regionality, this is another area where uh, where the results um, you know are kind of lopsided. Uh, we're looking at uh, the the vast majority of LP WAN activity to be occurring in the Asia Pacific over the next five years. And uh, this, when I say Asia Pacific, this we we've divided our research into three segments: the what you see here, Americas, EMEA, and Asia Pacific. But just to be clear, this is China. Um, the, the, uh, most of the activity, there's a lot of activity in, in Asia Pacific, but most of it is going to be in China. A lot of that today is driven by the two technologies, uh, Laura, Laura and LoRaWAN and then NBIOT. Uh, Laura and LoRaWAN has been, have been in China for several years. They've got a kind of an established foothold there and continue to grow. Um, I, I kind of look at the, the growth of LoRa in China as more of a grassroots um, kind of growth, which to me is a, is a good thing because that shows true demand. Uh, NBIOT has been uh, massively pushed by uh, the Chinese government as well as um, very influential equipment providers such as Huawei. Um, but one of, one of the conclusions here is that if you want to be a volume leader, and if, your if you want your technology to be a volume leader in LP WAN over the next five years and, and further out than that, uh, you cannot do it without exposure to China. Okay, and this is our view of, uh, in, we, we divide the world into two network types, private and, pu and public. And this is our view of what's going on with these two types over the next, uh, uh, over the forecast period. And in the past, uh, LP WAN has been very much a private network phenomenon. Uh, and it, as a matter of fact, today it's, it still is. We are expecting 2019 to be the first year that public nodes outnumber private nodes uh, over all LP WAN technologies. Uh, we, do ex we do expect, uh, obviously, private uh, networks to still continue to grow. There's, a, there's definitely a place for private networks. Uh, it, it, T today and in the future, there's a number of industries that prefer private networks. Um, just in many cases, it's just because they prefer to put their money in, uh, uh, to, to skew their money towards CapEx rather than OpEx. Uh, or maybe they really, if it's really core to their business, they want total control over that infrastructure. We do expect that to continue. However, we do view public networks as, that's really the reason why we're all talking about LPWAN these days. Because LP1 has been has been around for for decades, literally, but it's only received attention in the past five years or so because of the emergence of public networks for LP1, and that we believe is the inflection point that's going to drive the volume and cause LP1 to become a much larger phenomenon. There's another there's, there's a number of applications uh, that really just aren't feasible at all without public networks, and it's not so much the application that's not feasible, but it's it's the it's the company or institution that's deploying that application. Um, not everybody obviously can afford uh, to, to deploy private infrastructure on a wide scale. Um, and so there's a lot of industries that just never plan to scale large enough to, to need private in infrastructure, or they wanna start out kind of with a bite-sized step into the, to the uh, IoT, and so public uh, networks are the way to do that. Um, so this is, uh, I've actually talked about most of these already. I'll go over them another again really quickly. 
Um, this is the key findings from our report. Uh, some of these I've already talked about. Obviously, uh, I say it's a two-horse race between L LoRa and NBIoT for the for the bulk of the volume. That's 86% of all connections by 2023, so a very sizable uh, chunk of the market. Uh, China will continue to lead in NBIoT market adoption. Our estimate today is, uh, I don't have the, the exact number at my, at, at my fingertips, but well over 90% of all NBIoT connections today are in China. And uh, we do expect that NBIoT will become a global phenomenon, but certainly China is driving the early market and um, it's, it, China will continue to drive adoption throughout our forecast period. It, it's not gonna slow down in China, it's only going to accelerate. What we're going to see is, is parts of the rest of the world uh, m coming up to speed on NBIoT, but a little bit more slowly. Um, despite that, uh, the NBIoT and LTE market adoption is slower than expected. Um, if you go back to about a year and a half ago when we were just starting to deploy NBIoT and LTEM, there were some really, really high expectations for these technologies, particularly the Chinese government and Huawei were throwing out numbers that were, that were well over 100 million uh, by the end of 2018. Well, by our estimations, that didn't happen and didn't even come close. Um, I, if I recall from, that, from, from our earlier forecast, we're, we're saying that there was about 27 million NBIOC connections in 2018. And that's a huge number. It's a huge growth rate, but it's not even close. As I recall, I think, I think Huawei was saying 150 million NBIOT connections by the end of 2018. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I, I seem to recall that was correct. And so obviously it's nowhere close to that, um, but it's still a significant uh, uptake in China. Uh, 2019 will be the first, first year uh, for public connections to outweigh private connections. Uh, again, this, we view this as a key inflection point. Uh, and that's one, that's, that's one reason why we, we, our forecast is for five years, but we, we, view, that, we view that as just scratching the surface. Uh, the LP WAN and IoT connectivity in general is going to play out over a much, much longer time than five years. In five years, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a much better idea of what's going on. There'll be much larger volumes in the billions of units, but um, we, we definitely believe that a lot of these ap emerging applications are not going to s find the knee in their curve until well after that five-year forecast period. So we're just beginning to scratch the surface. This is, gonna, this is something that's gonna play out over decades. Uh, as a region, don't underestimate the influence of the Asia Pacific, particularly China. Um, it's going to account for what we, we believe will be about two out of three nodes at the, at the end of the forecast period. And finally, I, I didn't talk about Sigfox very much, um, but one, one thing I found very interesting about Sigfox is um, uh, this, this indication here. I view this as kind of an indication of the fragility of the Sigfox ecosystem today, uh, and that is that a single company, Securitas, accounts for 45% uh, of the 6.2 million Sigfox connections as of February 2019. And this is not an IHS market estimate. This is in a press release from Sigfox. So, um, so to me, that's, it's, to them, I'm sure that's an indication, that, you know, they've got this large customer, but to me, that's an indication that they've, that really too much of the ecosystem is wrapped up in, in one customer. And um, this, is, this is really, I've, I've probably gone over time, I don't know, I lose, I lose track, but I haven't talked much about I've just really touched the tip of the iceberg here. Um, I have much more to talk about. If you'll find me later today, feel free to ask me questions about any of the topics I've covered today. I'll be happy to go into more detail. Thank you.